back in the mid 1980s. Am I on? Always on. You're always on. <laughs> yeah. Someone please tell Wendy I'm always on. Okay. <laughs> in the mid 80s. Um, the fellow named Michael Milken. Anybody remember him? Michael Milken was convicted of insider trading. Uh, at the time, he was a very wealthy guy. I mean, he was just really rich. But like a lot of people, he believed he always needed more. Cut corners, broke the law, hurt a lot of people, did some time. After he was caught, Michael Milken's wife asked him why he did it. He responded that what he had was never enough. He always needed more. One of his associates said that when he made his first hundred thousand, he needed two hundred thousand. When he made his first two hundred thousand, he needed a million. When he made his first million, uh, he needed three, and it just kept growing. There was something missing inside Michael Milken. It's not a story about him, by the way. It's a story about you and a story about me. You probably know enough about church to know that's what's going on here. Uh, anyway, but there's something missing. He thought he could fill it by getting more money, more houses, more cars, more prestige, more fame, whatever. He thought that would fill it. In this series, All I Want for Christmas, we're talking about the deepest longings of the human heart. The things that we absolutely want the most. And what are they? What do, what do we want? Something. But what exactly? Today is about not settling. It's about, it's about not settling for, for less. It's about wanting and going for the absolute very best. Today we're going to be talking about heaven. That home where there are no goodbyes. Heard a story about a doctor, a lawyer, and a, a, what was the third one? Doctor, a lawyer, and a politician. Ooh, spit when I see him. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was, it was a doctor, law, and politician. They show up at the pearly gates, and St. Peter's there, and he, and he says, well, welcome, guys. Uh, before I admit you, we're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to answer a question. And he says it's going to be you know, very difficult, degrees of difficulty according to the way you lived on on earth. And so he, he turns first to the doctor. You know, it's been his life healing people. And he says, what was the name of that ship that sank after hitting an iceberg on its maiden voyage? You know, the doctor said, well, that's the Titanic. And he said, that's right. Uh, please come on in to, to heaven. Welcome. He turned to lawyer who was, you know, sort of an ambulance chaser, did a little pro bono, but you know, kind of. And uh, so the question needed to be a little bit harder. And so St. Peter looked at him and he said, do you know how many people died on the Titanic? Lawyer was a little bit of a history nerd, and he said, well, I'm pretty sure it was about 1,500. About 1,500. Peter says, close enough. You can come on in. You can, you can come on in. And, and uh, finally he uh, turned and looked at the politician, looked him up and down. He said, as for you, I want you to name all 1,500. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to be looking at the book of Hebrews, some people who were struggling uh, to hang on to their faith, to, to stay loyal to Jesus. And in Hebrews 11, we, we see this uh, list of wonderful people. And, and we're going to start uh, after he's named a few of them, verse 13 in Hebrews 11. And it goes like this. All these people, what people? The people that he's just mentioned, you know, and, and others like... Noah and Abraham and Moses and Enoch and whoever else you know. And he says, all these people died still believing what God had promised them. That is that they would have a home. That they would have a place. They did not receive what was promised. But they saw it from a distance. And they welcomed it. One lovely uh, night, moonlit night, a uh, Grandpa and his small granddaughter went out for a walk, and a lot of stars out, you know, it's magnificent. And the grandfather knew a little bit, you know, so he started naming a constellation or two, and 
a couple of the stars and the granddaughter's just you know soaking it all in and after a few minutes looking up the sky she says grandpa if the bottom side of heaven is this beautiful what must the top side what must that look like what we see from a long ways off is surely coming God has promised it his, we may not have it all yet, but the promise is there. Back to verse 13, they agreed, these people that he named, you know, who were faithful to God, they agreed that there were foreigners and nomads here on the earth. Uncomfortable here, because they were going to be comfortable there. And, and that's the way it works. Foreigners and nomads, not a negative thing to say, foreigners and nomads. They, they just weren't at home here. They did not fit in. They did not belong. They, this was... This was their own self-assessment. They saw themselves in this way. You know, uh, foreigners and nomads. They valued something else more than the here and now. Listen to me, Christian. You were made for another place. You, you, were, you weren't made for here. You were made for another place. I mean, you know, like the song says, you know, that old song, you're just passing through or whatever, you know, you were made for another place, another earth. You have a new heavens and the new earth. You were made for that. So don't settle down here. Don't get too comfortable with the here and now. Verse 14, obviously people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. It's what we're, we're all looking for a place, a home, and literally everybody searches, but very few are willing to look at the one place that can fill our souls. So we set up for other things, little things, cheap things, transitory things, small, uh, gaudy, uh, temporary things. Hebrews calls us to lift our eyes, to want more, not settle for less, you know, not settle for the little things, the transitory, temporary things. Our problem is we don't want enough. It's not that we want too much. It's that we don't want enough. God made something greater for us, and he made us for something greater, someone greater. You were made by and for Jesus himself. He's the home that God made for us. C.S. Lewis said there have been times when I think we do not desire heaven, you can understand that because we have a long track record of uh, trying to convince uh, ourselves and God and everybody else that we don't and trying to avoid it. Lewis goes on to say, but more often I find myself wondering whether in our heart of hearts we have ever desired anything else. I mean, look at our, look at our incessant searching for happiness, for, for contentment, security, pain-free living, you know, for our, our, our own joy. I mean, what is that? I mean, it sounds like heaven, right? All the bad stuff gone. I mean, what we fill with trinkets, the Bible teaches, is our inherent need for God. <clears throat> Back to chapter 11. But not them. They didn't do that. No. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. They could have settled. They could have gone back. Which, by the way, was and is <clears throat> the danger for followers of Jesus. That's what we're tempted toward. The, their journey and uh, through this place was hard. It was a struggle for them. They were persecuted, bone-weary, tempted to turn back to their old life. Maybe not in one grand swooping act. <laughs> but maybe more like us, just a few degrees here, just a, just a little bit there. Just neglect this, take that. You know, what's the big deal? They could have done that. <clears throat> they didn't, why? They knew there was nothing permanent here. And they were looking, verse, uh, verse 16, for a better place, a, a heavenly homeland. That's why God's not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, chances are, unless you work at the funeral home, in which case you would beat me by a long shot, chances are I have been to a lot more funerals than you. I'm betting. 
um, you'd be surprised how often I have heard Christians, I mean, Christian people, love Jesus, trust Jesus, baptize believers, you know, in church, all that stuff. Talking about heaven as though it was something small. A nice little touch. I don't, I don't know. It's a nice little touch. It's, it's what we settle for when things don't work out as we hoped. <laughs> and you know what? It never works out as we hope it's going to work out. Not ever. Even in the best case scenario, if you live a long and fruitful and good and happy life, guess what? Eventually, you got to check out. You got to leave your home here. The mortality rate on the planet is still 100%. And you hear people say stuff like, now catch this, and there's an element of truth here. That's what makes it so undermining. It catches us, uh, catches us off guard. We say things, well, at least I'll see them in heaven. Okay, at least I'll see them in heaven. I mean, I get it when your heart's hurting and it's broken. Maybe that's just all you can say, but at least we get to see them in heaven. You know, it's like, well, you know, second prize isn't that bad. Second prize really is if heaven itself were a consolation prize. You know, like when they give every kid a trophy, you know, even though they lose, kids aren't dumb. I mean, they know they lost you. They know you're doing this, and if they whine a little bit, you'll buy them a hamburger on the way home or something, a juice box or whatever. They know the loser's trophy doesn't count for much, if anything. What I want you to see this morning is that heaven is not a consolation. It's our highest ambition. I mean, along with the glory of God, and they run hand in hand, this is our highest ambition. Our number one goal is to be there in heaven with him. And the reason why heaven is so amazing and so desirable is because we will be in the unobstructed presence of Jesus, the presence of God with no distance between us, face to face with him. I really do want you to see this and because we have so many bad ideas and weak thoughts about heaven and it's such a great resource if we get it right. The thing about heaven, uh, it's not like God made this awesome place, five-star accommodation, amazing, you know, super place, you know, with everything you'd ever want. It's the most greatest, most epic place ever. And, you know, sort of topped off like a cherry on top. Won't it be great when God shows up on special days? <laughs> That's not what it is. That's not what heaven is about. The whole reason and the only reason that heaven is great uh, the reason it's beautiful, the reason it's pain-free, the reason heaven is perfect is because Jesus will be there and we will be with him. He is what makes heaven, heaven. And apart from him, it's not. I love what A.M. Hunter, great New Testament scholar, uh, talked about. He, he told uh, this Christian man that he knew who was dying. It was a, a doctor who was also a Christian. And the man turns to the doctor and he's really near the end. And he says, please tell me. Something about the place where I'll be. The doctor sort of considered his reply and he heard a scratching at the door behind him and he had his answer. He said, you hear that scratching at the door? He asked the patient and the patient uh, you know, says, yeah. And he says, that, he goes, it's my dog. I left him downstairs, but he's grown impatient and he's come up and he hears my voice. He hasn't ever seen what is behind this door, what's inside this room, but he knows that I am here. And he wants to come in. Isn't that the same with us? I mean, we don't know what it all is, and we don't know everything. The Bible tells us some stuff, some good stuff, and we're going to look at it, but you know, the Bible tells some wonderful things, but we don't know everything that lies behind that door, what we do know. Jesus is there. And because of that, it's heaven. He makes heaven worth wanting. And Jesus is what, what makes uh, it worth uh, settling or setting anything else aside in order to have heaven. If Jesus were not going to be in heaven, if God was not going to be there, and it was just something that went on and on, make no mistake, that would be hell. 
if Jesus isn't there, if God is not there for all eternity, it's not heaven. It's the opposite of heaven. Verse 14, for um, this world is not our permanent home. We're looking forward to a home yet to come, this world. This world where so many people are broken and hurting and, and too many homes crumbling and every person in every home eventually has to say goodbye. I mean, well, we want a home where nobody says goodbye, ever. But this world's not our permanent place, right? This, this world where cancer seems to rule, where disappointment and discourage and discouragement and dysfunction, disease, divorce and death, none of that is going to be there. None of it's going to be in heaven. You know, if you're an older person uh, and, you know, however you define that, and I sort of put myself in that category. You know, if you're an older person and you mourn the fact that you can't do everything you used to do, I want you to understand this. Don't miss what heaven is. Don't miss what the promise is. I want you to understand your best is not behind you. Your best is ahead of you. It's on the way. It is coming. And this is true for the young, by the way. You may feel strong and like you're hitting on all cylinders. Trust me, you are not. Your best, your best is, it is still to come. There is a new and improved you coming at the resurrection of the dead. It's the perfect you. It's the you God always intended. You know, C.S. Lewis said in The Weight of Glory, if you saw yourself in heaven, you would be tempted to bow down and worship. The new and improved you, the resurrection you, it's the perfect you. A lot of us you know, look back at the good old days and long for them. <laughs> Bible teaches us the good old days haven't even happened yet, haven't even started. I mean, all we have heard is the prelude. We haven't even begun to sing. I mean, it's, it's just getting cranked up. You think you lived your good old days, what you thought were your best years, your best performance, your happiest season of life, it is all ahead of you, every bit of it, all the best stuff. And what you've gotten is hints at good things, but deeper in the back of your mind, you know it's just this isn't going to last. This isn't permanent. I want a home where nobody says goodbye. And God answers, well, the best is yet to come. Your greatest adventures are ahead of you. You ever thought about that? What are you like? Some of you like 85, 90 even. I mean, what, I mean some, I was hearing, you know, it's, it's kind of up there. And, you know, listen, your greatest adventures, they're ahead of you. They're coming. If you haven't had them, don't look back at the good old days. Look ahead for the good old days. I mean, think about it. The greatest taste, the greatest smells and feelings and affections and the greatest everything. It's all in the future for you. Think about this one. To run again. I mean, like really run. I mean, not old man run. You know, you can do that. But I mean, to run again, which you will. To run and not grow weary. To run and not grow faint. I mean, the unimaginable, the, the joy of taking off running just because there's a long haul in front of you. Remember that? Just take off running. Or there's a meadow. And what's it there for? I don't know except to run through it. It's magnificent. Running. I mean, who, who in this room is ready for something new? I mean, I want to hear from you, church. Do you have a pulse? Is, is anybody ready for something new in this room? Think how wonderful heaven is going to be. Imagine the earth the way it was for that brief period of time before sin caused every molecule of the cosmos to deform, decompose, and as Paul put it, groan. I mean, yeah, we live on a hard planet. <laughs> we just do. Our hearts break almost daily. You know it's true? Almost daily. But this world's not our permanent home. The, this world where too many homes are broken, where everybody does have to say goodbye. I mean, this, this, is, this doesn't last. This, this, is, this is not the world. Our heartache is temporary. But our real home, man, that is, <laughs> that's forever. 
it's forever. Heartache is temporary. Our home is forever. I'm, I'm growing more excited thinking about heaven. And, and I think we all should. I think we should talk about it more. You know, we should long for it more, our eternal home. I mean, we have this forever home beyond all hurt. Heartache is temporary, but our home is forever. I mean, do you think about heaven? I mean, do you? Do you ponder heaven? Does it come to mind daily, once a week, once a month? You know, those rare times that I talk about it, my failing, those rare times, you know? Do you think about heaven? What, 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 is, what is heaven? What do you think? What do you see? You know what I look forward to? I look forward to seeing my grandparents, Albert and Minnie Barnhart, M-I-N-N-I-E, and uh, James Robert and Lois Talaferro. Four really wonderful saints of God. And you're looking forward to, to seeing the child you lost, your spouse of many years, your mom, the grands, you know. It's, it's going to be a, a glad reunion. I'm looking forward to seeing friends of mine from this church who've gone on to see them. I'm not going to name them all because, one, I probably couldn't. And, uh, and two, I pray I forget somebody, but... I love my church, including those who have departed. I, I can't wait to see them again. And the colors of heaven. Did you think about the colors of heaven? I mean, it's just because colors are not what they're supposed to be. It falls short. I mean, how green will the green grass be on the trees of heaven? How bright the flowers, how beautiful the scenery. Uh, better than anything we've ever laid before our eyes. It's just a hint what we see now. The Grand Canyon, Big Sur, the ocean, you know, Everest. It's just a hint, just the slightest glimpse of this magnificence that God created and will recreate, will bring anew. We're going to finally see things and experience things just like God originally intended. It's going to be like Eden <laughs> all over again. Uh, listen, that's, uh, that's worth whatever we have to endure. That's part of what he's telling this, this church, the Hebrews. He's, uh, this is worth anything. This should be our highest ambition. But the only reason that you and I can hope for heaven is what Jesus did on the cross, what God did on that Easter morning. I mean, it's the only, only reason that we can. The, the resurrection gives us hope. The cross and the resurrection. God took the evil done on the cross, and by the resurrection, he secured for us the hope of heaven. The cross tells us um, that he not only understands our pain, but he can defeat it and transform it and make it into something good. The hope of heaven begins for you and me when our lives are at their toughest, at their darkest. Remember the story of the little boy playing little league baseball and he's sitting there on the bench and man walks up behind him and you know got his hands on the screen little boy's there inside the screen sitting on the bench watching the game and, and uh, he says to the boy what inning is it little boy says top of the first well how's it going little boy looks up and says we're behind 21 to nothing he says oh kid man I'm sorry he says, oh it's okay mister they haven't even put our runs on the scoreboard yet. <laughs> Listen, that's kind of, I know sometimes you feel like you're down 21 to nothing and there isn't a possibility of a win, but our runs are not showing up yet on the scoreboard, but we have a hope that is certain. It's a perfect plan. It's a perfect peace. It is a perfect place with a perfect God. I want you to be encouraged today. Make your home forever. Your highest ambition. Make that be the thing you long for. See, in the end, Jesus is going to win. So hold on to him with all you have. I heard Max Lucado uh, tell a story once uh, about a guy named Carl McConnell. Um, it's a great uh, story. He's a really great guy. People love Carl McConnell. Just, you know, wonderful guy. Lived in Texas back during the you know, the late 70s, Carl moved from Texas to Alaska and started working on the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline. And then he had this dream. He wanted to have a, this grand adventure. 
and he decided that uh, uh, he was going to do a photo expedition of Alaska, the part of it that he could cover. I mean, it's a very small part, but beautiful. And, and so he settled for this five-month trip where he would be dropped off um, by, a, by a plane uh, in a remote area of Alaska and spend the summer taking pictures, writing down his experiences. His friends uh, remembered how he organized for the trip, just meticulous, carefully planning, you know, arranged to a plane to take him and, and all his supplies. You know, he had all the right provisions to take him out 75 miles from the nearest town. He, uh, he had a couple of rifles, shotgun, uh, 1,400 pounds of supplies, 500 rolls of film. Some of y'all won't even know what that's for, but 500 rolls of film. <laughs> He set up his tent and, you know, started this great adventure alone, blissfully unaware of the oversight that would cost him his life. Carl made no arrangements to be picked up. Of all the things to forget, I mean, it's just, how did he, I don't know how he did it. It's, it's amazing. He had this plane drop him off. He had everything prepared, meticulously organized, but he didn't talk to anybody about making sure they'd come back and get him. And he didn't even remember his mistake until August. And we know that because he recorded his thoughts and they were found by the Rangers when they picked him up, the state troopers, and, and they found his body that following February. He wrote these words in an understatement the size of Alaska itself. <laughs> He said, I think I should have paid more attention to arranging my departure. <laughs> That's something. Winter set in. Alaska winter. Not 59 degrees with three days of drizzle winter. This is Alaska winter. And uh, he had no hope of rescue. Trapped with no exit plan, simply waiting for the end. How did he do that? I, I don't know how he did it. I really don't. You know, he knew he'd be there temporarily. He knew he wasn't going to be there forever. He knew he was going to have to leave. He knew all this. How can somebody know they're going to be there temporarily and not make any plans for the future? We see it all the time. It happens all the time. Uh, everybody knows. You and I know. We're temporary residents here. This isn't going to last. It's not our home. We're looking for something far better. We are short timers on this earth, and we need to have an exit strategy, no matter our age. So have you given any thought to what's coming next for you? Your time here is so brief. The world eventually brings heartache. Jesus offers you home forever. It's probably time to start making some arrangements. Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. You're good and faithful and true and beautiful. All these wonderful things that we want, rest and peace and plenty and painlessness, no tears, that's you. It's not some location where you walk in the room or the city and it just magically happens. No, no, it's, it's your presence, and that's what we long for. That's what we want. Father, help us to want it more. Help us to trust you with all that we are, all that we have, and placing our lives in your hands, we can be confident that somebody's going to come back. It's in Jesus' name we pray.